hi there it's november 30th 2023 welcome to episode 300 of Rook, I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam Dustan Aziz Durut Bashama. Hope you are doing well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. And first and foremost, 300 shows. That's something, as my dear late father would say. Hamas Karanat, a word that most people cannot understand, it seems, maybe because it isn't a word. But it is straight from my dad's Khuzestan vocabulary of the mid 20th century Iran. Hamas Karanat, but I digress. 300. This is quite a milestone for us and a proud moment. I wasn't always sure we would make it past episode three, let alone 300, but here we are. And with quite a back catalog of essays, episodes, guests, issues. In truth, if we include our different series, like the Contemporary History of Iran series, or Talking to Persians, or a lot of the other content we've created, Rook Media has produced well over 350 full episodes of different shows. But for our flagship Rook, this is number 300, and it has been quite a journey. Uh, a huge debt, of course, is owed to our little team that has been so dedicated and passionate over the last three and a half years, working on a startup with limited funding and the headaches of getting our name out there and establishing ourselves is not always fun. But the team has always believed in the mission to be telling the stories of Iranians and trying to help understand and maybe even help shape our identity for the millions of us of Iranian descent living outside of Iran. And uh, then an even bigger debt is owed to you guys out there who have been listening, subscribing, sharing, commenting, uh, supporting our content. We love you folks from around the world who've really given this show a chance and been part of our story. We launched Rook in April of 2020 in the aftermath of the shooting down of Flight 752. And in fact, we dedicated our first episode to the victims of that horrific atrocity at the hands of the Islamic Republic regime. And our first guest was, of course, Hamid Ismailoun. We then grew our program through COVID, starting off entirely as an audio podcast, even though we had conceived of this as an interview show on video and we had created a studio for that purpose. Then Zoom was invented. Yeah, remember the Zoom era only began less than four years ago. And so we started mixing in video content as well. And there was a fair amount of skepticism about whether this could work. Really though, a multi-platform podcast that's aimed at the Iranian diaspora with long interviews in English, hosted by Jian. Who's the audience? Who's going to care? And aren't, aren't you gonna run out of guests? <laughs> Those were just some of the questions lobbed at us. Well, over 16 million streams later, we've discovered that there are people who care and appreciate the content. And, you know, while it has been an ongoing challenge to fund this project, when, when we say those things each week about hoping you'll join our Patreon page and become a Rook member, it's literally about survival for this, this network. But I dare say we've not only survived, but we've done so with, we hope, the integrity of knowing that we are entirely independent. In other words, beholden to no political party or interest group or rich nation or government PR device or ideological lobby. And maybe that's what sets us apart when there are a growing number of outlets trying to address Iranian stories and interviews, but with fidelity to their financial backers. We do have total independence. And maybe that has even been confusing for our audience at times too like we're not going to be advocates for only one opposition figure or we're going to bring on a diversity of voices or we're going to allow for a bunch of conflicting opinions in short yes that is what being independent means and we've clawed our way the whole journey to try at the very least to maintain a postulate of objectivity and so today at episode 300 we begin something of a new era of rook with a somewhat new format two parts to each episode where we'll have one part a round table with our regulars and special guests who will address and debate the issues of the day or our cultural quirks or our societal realities and a second part that will include a feature interview each time. So today that interview is with the ever impressive environmentalist and academic Kaveh Madani, who joins me in the Rook studio in a little while to address the state of the environmental crisis globally and in Iran. This on the occasion today, that of the uh, 28th UN Climate Change Conference, which begins in Dubai, and also on the day when news has just come out that the last six months have been the hottest in the history of the planet. 
you don't want to miss this conversation with Kaveh Madani. You never want to miss a conversation with Kaveh Madani, but especially at this moment in history. But first up, we have the roundtable. And speaking of our mission to stay as independent media, there are a couple of conversation points for today's roundtable that cannot be untangled from the state of media today. The truth is, you may not want to hear it, you probably don't want to know about it, you definitely don't want to think about it, but terror is continuing under the current regime in Iran, and that includes executions that are happening daily in Iran today. And yet, where are these atrocities in the news? Even in the Persian media, why are they not trending on social media the way they were just a few months ago? We're, we're going to discuss that on the roundtable. And maybe this is linked to the agenda of TV networks, news, news agencies, and digital media in general, and from whom and where we are supposed to get our information. A few days ago, I was watching CNN, the feed from the United States, and the coverage was all about some of the hostages returning back to Israel after that deal done with Hamas in exchange for the return of Palestinian prisoners. The coverage was what you would call blanket coverage, 24-7. And we are all familiar with how CNN will run with the narrative and turn it into breathless coverage if it seems like it's getting ratings. And hey, surely this is a compelling and important story, right? Both in geopolitical terms and in the human stories of these hostages reuniting with their families after they've been abducted by terrorists. But after a few hours, I decided to try some other outlets. I switched over to Al Jazeera English. And you may not be surprised to find out that the coverage there was only incidentally mentioning the hostages, but was deeply and profoundly and movingly and comprehensively focused on the level of dest destruction and death in Gaza amongst the Palestinians. It was, if you will, an entirely different focus and narrative. And while both stories were in fact happening, like these weren't manufactured stories, they suggested a very different emphasis that would play upon emotions and political sensibilities in completely separate ways. It's, it's not that we don't expect MSNBC to run anti-Trump stories and Fox News to run positive ones, but when both, say, CNN and Al Jazeera are ostensibly bringing us world news, we can see that we may end up developing our personal opinions based on what we are fed. And don't get us started on social media, where the diet is entirely about affirmation and not information. That is seeking out sources that end up feeding you back the opinions and stories you want to hear, rather than what may be closest to the truth. This gets even more difficult in the Iranian context. We certainly know the bias of Iranian state TV, but we also know that any other Iranian media outlet is beholden to its funding source. So how should we actually get our information and from whom? We will discuss that on the Roundtable First Step. Really good to have you with us. This is episode 300. Let's get started. This is Rook. Here we go, episode 300. Let's get the roundtable started. All of our participants are in the Rook studio here. She's our regular Rook Roundup specialist, a producer for us here, and the former president of the Iranian Students Association at York University, <laughs> my alma mater as well, Smart Pega Ganji. Hello. Hello. Uh, she is an Iranian-Canadian marketing strategist, designer, media observer. She's here in the studio as well. Resident Raha Ru. Hello, Raha. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> and our special guest, he's an Iranian-Canadian engineer and YouTuber based in Toronto. His YouTube channel, under his own name, focusing on languages and culture, has grown to be one of the most popular channels in the world with millions of views here in the Rook studio as well is Bahadur Alas. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to have you back on the program and part of the roundtable. Happy 300th to Rook. Yes, happy yes. 300. Happy I was expecting some yes. sort of 
candy or something. I thought maybe <laughs> you'd turn up with some nabot. Or I didn't know. We'll have if cake I knew, after. I would have. Well, you knew the last one was two ninety nine. <laughs> no, I didn't. So by deduction, <laughs> right. I, I, yeah. you're a marketing specialist. That's I thought, true. So um, my, next time. <laughs> <laughs> I We have a lot to talk about on the on the roundtable. And of course, uh, Kaveh Madani coming up in just a little while in the Rook studio. And as I say, um, uh, this climate conference is just starting in Dubai today. It's important to have him on the program and discuss where exactly we're at with this environmental crisis globally as he works with the UN now and also in Iran, which he's intimately familiar with. But um, first up, the roundtable. And even before we get to the roundtable, I wanted to give you guys an update on the Iranian-made weapon that is the lingering scent of Orma <laughs> Oh, God. Because uh, now, about I don't know if you know this, what I'm talking about here, but uh, about a month, <laughs> this is a true story. About a month ago now, I mean, I think this is five weeks or something. Yeah, right it's now. been a while. I um, I I made it, it, you know similar to a nuclear leak at Three Mile Island in the 1970s, in the late 1970s. Uh, some korma sabzi that my mother, my dear mother, had given me, leaked out of the Tupperware and into the back seat oh. of my car. And onto the seat and onto some of the, the bags, <laughs> the metro bags on there. Uh, this this Gorma Sabzi uh, scent has been terrorizing me <laughs> since. Now, this I only bring this up today because I've certainly talked about it enough. And I've tried everything. I've tried all kinds of detergents, uh, some some cleaning products. I mean, uh, the, you know, I tried the, the car. I took the car in for a cleaning. I, oh, wow. I washed the bags. I did, you know. You didn't throw out the reusable bag. I did not. Throw After out the, all of that, I know. I know. Don't get me started. Everybody's oh like, Are you, I'm, "This is how cheap I am." I, Instead of I washed candies, them. I washed the bags. Ask for new bags for me, yeah. like that. And that, yeah. So you, so listen. So this was fast forward to this week. Okay. We're five weeks later. Yes. Because I think now I'm you know I have become acclimatized clearly to the to my right, car despite the fact that I I vowed to not allow any non-Iranians to get into oh. the car because I I fear that they will you know they'll castigate they'll have an impression of us as mm -hmm. based on this uh, this this weapon this smell of uh, um so at the beginning of the week mm -hmm. I met with a, a business person who um, may be interested in sponsoring being part of you know for Rook Media it's right. an important meeting right you want it. You want him. You know. You want to. Want things to go well. Right. This person. She is a, a Iranian. A, a very elegant and and um, successful professional. Mm -hmm. And we were going from one place to to over to her office. And I said, Oh, I don't. I don't mind driving. Oh, oh forgetting. I that. forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that I forgot that I I should have sold the car, <laughs> I, uh, uh, by which I mean given it away, yeah. anything to, and I, this is no word of a lie. She got in the car and she said, "Oh, you can see Korma as if as if the Korma Sabzi had been consumed earlier that morning in you know? the car." Yeah, I mean, and I was just like, "Oh, oh, you you can." You should have pitched my idea. That's why I gave it to. <laughs> That's him. right, uh, to a business person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Her idea that is the, we should a it? special car wash designed just for yeah for Korma Sabzi. Like, the reason why you can you you're smelling that is because I want to pitch you this other idea. Right. You should start. Spill Gorma yeah. Sabzi with impunity. That's a, that, do whatever you want. Our car wash will. will take, can we turn up Raha just a little bit? Uh, but do you know. have a solution? That, that's what I want to yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. How, how do did they, you can't just this come business up with doesn't idea. work. Yeah. yeah, yeah like um, bleach. <laughs> right. that's, mentioned that Every before. Persian mother's. I have to bleach my black car. Right. The black oh. interior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bleach. So anyway, yeah. I mean, there you go. It's a, it's a, it's terrorism. This Corbin Sabzi. Um, okay, now we've got two major subjects. I have three, uh, but I think we'll probably at least hopefully get to two before we get to our first one, which I want to talk about the um, the ongoing executions and also and 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 concomitantly the lack of outcry or or attention this is getting. Just before that, uh, we've just found out a few hours ago. It's. It's Thursday, November 30th. We're in the late afternoon that, that we're in early evening now. That Too Much Salehi, mm -hmm. the Iranian rapper, has been arrested again. Yes. So um, uh, is there any news on that that you want to update us on? Or 
Yeah, I mean, like you said, we, we've just gotten reports that he was arrested once again earlier today. So um, for anyone who wasn't aware, he was actually released on bail just a couple of days ago. I think on the 18th it was. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of specifications about what the release was about, what the bail conditions were, anything like that. But what we did see is that he was released. It was wonderful. Then about three days ago, he posted a video on YouTube um, kind of chronicling what the last year had been like for him. Um, mentioning some of the um, some of the atrocities that he had to deal with, some of the torture, some of um, the physical, the mental, um, the battles that he had to go through. Although I found like the video walked a line. It did. did. It yeah. very much walked. So it a didn't line. seem like it was well, going to be uh, incendiary enough to, to to cause issues. And I but. think that was the intent: is that you know he was trying to get his message across, but at mm. the same time he was trying to be very careful. Um, and then, you know, everyone's been really happy about the fact that he's been released, of course, after more than a year. Um, but of course, today uh, he was abducted and detained. And the reason why I say abducted is because there's reports of plainclothes officers um, basically just picking him up at random. Um, and even more reports that he was actually beaten severely during the abduction. But that's pretty much as far as we have. Um, well, any, anybody want to uh, say anything about this before we, we move forward? Well, Bowder? Uh, when I first heard about his release, uh, obviously I was very happy for him, uh, no longer having to be in prison and tortured and all the physical pain, emotional trauma that he went through. But I think it's, uh, it wasn't really, I, I, I couldn't personally celebrate at the, the, the event because the Islamic Republic regime doesn't just do things. <laughs> you know, they, you didn't they, believe it? No, because I knew... This is not going to last. I, n not that I knew, but I had a feeling that something was going to happen. Uh, you know, this regime will do whatever it takes to to benefit itself, right? Mm. They're not going to do things. Uh, not going to do things if they know it's going to harm them, right? So, so why why release him at all? I mean, a lot of things we don't know for sure, right? I don't mm. want to. I don't right. want to speculate, but. I just didn't feel like it was something that I could celebrate. I was just happy for him at that moment. Right. Uh, the same thing happened with, you know, for instance, uh, uh, last year with, um, uh, you know, other political prisoners that were released, and in some cases they were arrested again. Right, right, right. right. I think we talked about this before where even celebrating things since the last year and a bit has been almost guarded. It's like sure. guarded celebrations sure. because we always somewhere in mm. the back of our minds, we know that there's going to be something bad that's going to happen, yeah. regardless of if there's some good news that we've just heard or what that good news might look like. Well, maybe maybe that is a, a segue into our first topic for the roundtable today, which is that, as I mentioned in the introduction of the show, executions are continuing mm -hmm. in Iran. Uh, and almost entirely, universally, for the same unjust reasons. Why is there no more outcry? So I want to remind everybody that back in January of this year, same calendar year, just a few months ago, right? Um, when the executions began of some of the protesters who had been part of the uprising, there was two young men who were executed, if you remember, in Iran in January. Iranians, many Iranians in Toronto, let alone in Iran or around the world, were saying they could barely eat or sleep due to the news of the execution. Remember this? Mm -hmm. The people were, I mean, people were walking around like zombies, incredibly sad. You could yeah. feel the emotional weight of this around the world in the Iranian global diaspora and this was making news. It was on the news crawl of the local, you know, Toronto news stations. Mm -hmm. Executions are happening in Iran. W right now, what is happening is crickets in comparative terms. In the past seven days, one source uh, that I was reading says 24 people have been executed. On Tuesday alone, six people executed. Two of those executed two days ago are Hamid Reza Azari, who was 17 years old. Milad Zohrevand, who was 21. He was arrested during the uprising last year. We are simply not hearing much of an outcry about any of this. Why is that? We may know that the world doesn't care if that's become our mantra, mm -hmm. but have Iranians given up caring too? Who wants to go first? I'll start. Okay. Um, Pega. You know, I don't, I don't know if I can say that it's a, it's a matter of giving up or not caring. I think personally what I've seen is that there's so many Iranians who are just emotionally exhausted, and I'll even take it one step further, burnt out from 
well, frankly, the last 40 some odd years, but more so the last year and a bit. Um, and this burnout comes as a result of so many different things, especially if you're looking at it in the diaspora. You're hearing news, you're dealing with your own traumas as an Iranian, whether you've lived inside Iran or you haven't. You, of course, have family members there or you might not, and it's just based on your personal experiences. You're being forced to kind of condense these experiences into this neatly package or neatly into your nine to five jobs in a place where maybe so many other people don't understand things the same way. And it's just this constant flow of bad, false, hopeless, saddening information. And at some point, you know, it, you just, you feel burnt out for lack of a better term. I mean, I was, I was looking at it and there's studies that have reported 71% of activists in the diaspora have at one point experienced severe depression and loneliness. Mm. So, I mean, that stat alone tells us so much about, you know, why it is that we're maybe seeing less people be vocal about what it is, what is it that's happening? I think that's, I mean, that's a, it's a very good point. And we've even, as we've talked about on this Mm -hmm. program, we've even heard from the Rook audience saying yes. enough already with the Kamgeen like hey, can you guys just do some fun interviews with musicians mm-hmm. again what enough right uh, even with that said to me the delta between the amount of attention a few months ago and the lack of attention now is kind of startling mm-hmm. uh, and perhaps a reflection of where we're at politically in terms of uh, one doesn't want to say it, but in terms of people sort of giving up on uh, the expectations of a, a new revolution or something. Rahul? Yeah, I think activist fatigue is the word used, and mm-hmm. it's like a global thing that um, that exists. When you, when, you, when you do so much and you get so little as an activist, after a while you get really depressed, and I think that's what's happened with everyone, um, everyone actively working on this movement. But on, on the other side of it is the global climate and how all the attention is now on something bigger that's happening in the Middle East, which is the Hamas and and um, Israel situation. Something bigger is a value judgment. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, that's there's true. a lot of <laughs> things that might be considered bigger or yeah. smaller. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking in, in the lens of global media. The media, sure. Yeah, yeah I'm absolutely. not talking based on what right, I feel because right, right. yeah, the, the world's attention is exactly. somewhere else. Exactly, because because what how I feel or what I what I view as important is definitely not the same as what sure. the media is covering. Yeah. Um, but I think but I think all of this is playing into um, Iran not getting not getting the coverage it needs um, and that's that's my opinion Bahadur? yeah I, I would definitely agree with that in my opinion I think uh, a lot of activists it's not that they don't care they definitely do care it's not that it doesn't bother them it still does uh, but they feel that the the global attention is somewhere else so once they come out you know I'll just I'll just go back to last year when I was talking about a lot of uh, things that were going on in Iran so many people would come to me and, and say what about Palestine? Mm. What about the Palestinians? And I'm like, you know, I, I don't want to go down that, that, that path right now, but imagine right now, you know, like mm-hmm. Asa- people think that nobody cares, right? So th- th- I feel like that's what a lot of activists are sensing, that the attention of the world is somewhere else. Can I, can I suggest something else too, which is that, I mean, I'll put this out there to you guys. You tell me what you think, but you know, at the zenith, at the best moments of the uh, uprising, the Women, Life, Freedom uprising, at least in the diaspora last year. Um, and we talked about it. I think, Bahadur, you were even probably even on the show. Pega, you, you and I certainly talked about it on the mm-hmm. program. Um, you know, was walking with thousands and thousands of people in downtown Toronto, in Berlin, in L.A., in Sydney, Australia, in, in London. And, you know, this, this movement of people, um, most of whom aren't, professional activists mm-hmm. or regular activists, mm-hmm. whatever that is. Exactly. You know, in other words, the, the, that was part of why it was exciting, right? It right. was a bunch of people who don't normally gather on a Saturday are gathering on the Saturday. Exactly. And those people have, um, I, I don't want to say that they don't have the pedigree, you know, or they don't care, obviously, they do, but those people have a whole set of other things that, you know, or those of all of us have, have mm-hmm. you know, are, you have to worry about your kids or your mm-hmm. your your family or or your the economy or 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 whatever is is happening and that the expectation that we could have those people out there in the thousands week after week after week still now without seeing the results you know mm-hmm. i mean 
I think actually uh, when we talk about activist fatigue, I think the real activists are probably still out there uh, and, you know, probably do have fatigue but aren't mm-hmm. going to stop being out there because they, they know it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm-hmm. But that somehow um, it, we just can't expect everyone in this climate in this era of ADD and media and all of that to stay that focused and that galvanized and that activated for that long. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Of course. course. Mm -hmm. It absolutely makes sense. Sorry. Um, What I was going to say is that going back to what I was just mentioning about, you know, taking into consideration things like your nine to five job and being in an environment, especially in the diaspora where so much other life goes on you know you've got like you mentioned kids and family and life and work and all of these things that's the that's i think what made the last or last october november you know even beginning of the year um so interesting and so emotional for so many people was because despite life that was going on every day Mm -hmm. and despite the fact that so many of us have been away from iran um for so many years Mm -hmm. we still felt the need to show up in the thousands we Mm -hmm. still felt Mm -hmm. the need to to you know stand up for those that that we had to be their voice like the slogan said you know and i think that's the thing is going back to that it's hard to maintain that it's difficult to maintain that if you're not an activist and and especially because again we hear good news and then somewhere in the back of our mind we say well it's not really good news Hmm. it's almost like we've become deflated Mm -hmm. honestly for me the only good news would be the collapse of the islamic republic nothing else is a victory and i say this and people are like oh well no no that that that's not the right approach you know we can say like how this happened happened." i'm like yeah sure that's i'm i'm happy that certain things happen Mm -hmm. i'm happy that this individual is not going to suffer anymore but ultimately that's not good news the the good news is this regime being gone Mm -hmm. that's the only thing i can actually celebrate i think um I'm going to simplify it by saying last year there were two distinct groups gr- groups of people. One group started um, started doing everything they can for the woman life freedom, regardless if they were activists, if they were um, if they were doing it for the people inside of Iran or if they were doing it for themselves, but were outside of Iran because you heard a lot of people say, "I'm going to go back to that country once this all kind sure. of we win." And there was a group that didn't do anything. Not much has changed for them and they don't care. But the group that really did it all, they're just so disappointed. And I wanna, if they're, we're just, we just, I'm gonna put myself in that group because I feel like I'm, I qualify. Um, we're just so hopeless because we had so much hope and it, we were just getting high on it. And then we were like, we're so close and we're gonna get this. And then it was just a full on face down fall of okay, boom, everything's gone. Now, you know, everyone's tired. Nobody wants to, um, n- n- when, you, when you think about doing that again, you're like, it's not going to work because. It's a, it's a tough question to navigate because at the core of it seems to be how much can we expect of the people in the diaspora in terms of their focus time and energy for what's going on in Iran per day, per week, per month, per year. Uh, knowing that, I mean, it's not a zero sum. It's not like everybody in the diaspora is Elon Musk or like has <laughs> lots of money and is sitting on a, at a beachfront with a, a daiquiri in their hand, right? I mean, people, everybody's got problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in an economic crisis around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, there, are, there are other atrocities happening. There are even just talking about Iranians and the experience of, of, of being new immigrants or refugees or, you know, there's a lot going on. And then there's fear of being, uh, you know, depending on where you are in the world, fear of IRGC agents, uh, et cetera. So, so on the one hand, it's, well, how much can we expect of people? On the other hand, the language we were speaking la- last year, let's be real, was, you know, no stop till Brooklyn, right? I mean, <laughs> let's, you know, we're, we're not going to let this go. This time is different, mm-hmm. you know, uh, one solution revolution i mean long before that well, long before at least you know in the last calendar year before that was being used for uh by by pro palestinian activists that was that was the iranian slogan right that was like our you know yeah we're going to have a revolution here we go mm-hmm. um i mean we were on those demonstrations you know so mm-hmm. so it's 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 a tough one and m- maybe the second component of it is a chicken and the egg around the media coverage because i don't even see like I said in the intro, even in Persian media, 
I don't see as much of a focus on it. I don't see uh, Manitoba going, you know, all out to tell us about the executions mm-hmm. the, the way they would have six months ago. Now, that might be because the audience is saying, we don't want that. Exactly. You know, show us Reza Shah documentary. You know, I mean, who knows? But uh, I'm not sure which one comes first, but mm-hmm. that's also happening. It's just mm-hmm. not there. It's not hash. There aren't hashtags that are trending. There aren't, I mean, sometimes I find myself doing a double take going, really more people were executed like um, we're not doing something because it seems so absurd because it was the top of our agenda last year as a as a global community Mm -hmm. i I think back to you know six months ago maybe eight months ago and you know even in conversation there were so many times that it was almost like you know there, there were so many things to talk about there were so many things happening there were so many unfortunately horrific things happening that there was no shortage of things to cover whether it's by the media or demonstrations to attend if it's within the diaspora or you know um something to even slacktivism to post or share or you know Mm -hmm. that sort of thing and yet now i think you know even myself i find it difficult to even try and search for the news as to what's going on it's become more and more difficult you mean emotionally to, or literally no literally it's actually mm-hmm. become more and more difficult for me to find a source that will tell me what is going on um, perfect you segue. know whether it's in perfect Iran segue to topic here. two well done <laughs> topic number two round table how do we decipher current coverage of iran so i mentioned this in the introduction where i was uh, watching CNN and Al Jazeera, those are I was trying to use very obvious examples. Mm-hmm. Although I did watch both of them that day, um, media bias is no secret or surprise these days. Everybody kind of knows this, but with every major outlet seemingly beholden to one stakeholder, or, or stakeholder or another, how do you try to find accurate information about what's going on in Iran or even in the Iranian diaspora? In other words, we may know that the uh, Iranian state media is pro-regime, say, and Iran International is not pro-regime. We know that. But beyond that, can we trust all the information we are fed? Uh, do we understand the nuances, given who is funding these networks? Does Manotoa's clear pro pahlavi stance of recent skew its trustworthiness about diaspora news? Uh, I don't want to pick on Manotoa. There's, we can look at any, other, any network this way. Can we count on social media? Um, Western coverage is is the source for Iran, the New York Times. Uh, we all discussed that last year, and <laughs> mm-hmm. I think universally panned it as no, right? How do we actually get a sense of what is happening in Iran? Uh, I know you like to stay informed, Bahadur. What is your prescription? Well, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is uh, with any media outlet, uh, there's always going to be a bias. There's always going to be an audience that they have to satisfy. They have to cater what you know they broadcast so that it keeps the audience happy right so you have to keep that in mind so what i personally think we should do is look at different perspectives you know i I know people may find it ridiculous but i actually do i spend a lot of time studying uh you know news from tasneem and farce news these hardcore propaganda outlets of the islamic republic not because i i agree with what they say but because i want to get to understand the mentality of the viewership, right? So w- we have to sort of get the news from, you know, bits and pieces of it from everywhere and make, you know, I- if you can personally talk to people inside Iran and, and get, you know, news from them, that's the best source. But as sort far of. As I mean, depending on who you talk to, what part of town they're <laughs> yeah. in and what it, their opinions exactly. are, Exactly, right? so that's what I mean. But, but you have to put it all together and make your own personal judgment. Right, because and the same thing happens with social media. So you don't have a go-to. No, I I, I, I take one piece from here, one piece from there, and I and I and I put it all together to to make. And it other fun. than Iranian state media, what do you? <laughs> 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 what is your source? No, I, I mean I. There are a lot of figures on social media, um, who I know. They care mm. for Iran. Mm-hmm. They're not doing it for clout. They're not doing it because. They're, they're making money. They're not doing it because, well, I have this million people, you know, followers base right, right. that I need to, like, make them happy, right? No. So I, I, I say take, take their word, take what they say, make a wise judgment by yourself, right? And again, when it comes to the news, we don't have to always know everything. We have to accept the fact that sometimes you just don't know for sure. 
you know, you hear this from here, you hear that from there, and and you're like, well, I'm not really sure, and, and, and that that can happen. You know, that that's the that's the problem. It's not it's not like a hundred percent guarantee that we know everything, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. do exactly the same thing. I just hover through all the news uh, outlets that there are um, for this one news that I maybe like find on Instagram or whatever, um, or X. And then the first thing I do, if it's really important to me, I call Iran. I call my mm -hmm. relatives because they have a better understanding. Um, generally, they have a better understanding politically because from the, th from the moment they wake up, the TV is on and they're like hovering through all the channels. And they understand the biases of each channel because they're they just they know and they are living through it. So mm. um, I've heard m millions of times in my family say, "Oh, look at this channel. Obviously, they're this and this." And but they but we still listen. And then after that, they just combine all the information and they make up they they analyze it and they come up with their own conclusion. Exactly. So if it's in interesting to me and if I want to know exactly, I call a few people in Iran. Um, to see if there's accuracy to yeah. that information. I do feel like if if in the West, not to call everybody in the West dumb, but I do feel like in the West there there's a population that will watch Fox News or or MSNBC and and maybe not be aware, it seems, of the of the the very endemic sort of bias of what uh, within the network For or the, sure. the slant or the, the narrative um, and and sort of just buy into this is my these are my people and I believe what they're saying and this For is sure. the narrative I, I agree with I feel like Iranians are generally I mean we know we have our um, our, our passion for conspiracy theories, but I think Iranians are generally more skeptical in general of, of everything. Yes. And so so media bias is something that is somewhat baked in, although we've had people come on the program over the last you know uh, couple of years and say, well, you know, how do you expect maybe some of the older generations inside Iran that are just watching state TV to know all of this stuff that you know they're they're being fed a certain narrative that they they kind of eat up so um, maybe that happens inside iran as well pega um i think you know i agree with everyone i think seeking news um is an individual task i don't think it the onus is on the individual i think to really find the news whether it's from numerous sources family members or whatever else but I think that's especially mm -hmm. true when it comes to complex geopolitical situations, especially with Iran. Um, you know, there's so many things to consider. I think you have to look at, first of all, the diverse resources, whether it's TV channels, X, Persian Twitter, like we talk about, um, Instagram or, or the likes. Um, it's fact checking. So going to actual scholarly sources, um, reading a book every now and then, you know, history. We have a lot of history. What are scholarly sources? What, actual, like history books you know mm -hmm. thinking about what has occurred in the past and more importantly i think um you know it's important to to keep in mind the history and the context in which all of this is happening mm -hmm. and i'm only talking about the situation with iran right now not news as a whole but it's really important to look at the past 40 some odd years so when we're talking about biases when we're talking about you know um catering to a certain demographic or audience or whatever mm -hmm. it's really important to keep that in the back of our minds and I think this applies more to Iranians because we're so well versed in the nuances and maybe not everybody else. But speaking as an Iranian, that's something that I definitely do. Uh, I don't, you yeah, no, for sure. I agree. I mean, when I talk to people inside Iran and individuals who have never left the country, they, they grew up there, they've been there their entire lives. And I'm, I'm very impressed by the fact that they don't just, uh, you know, take things, you know, if, if they, they're fed something, if they're told something, they don't just believe it. Right. They they're always, uh, you know, thinking. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do more research. I'm gonna. I, I mean, mm -hmm. there are exceptions. There, you know, and you, you see that on on social media. There's the Islamic Republic's online army of Arzashis who yeah. are just, for lack of better terms, incredibly delusional and stupid. Right. So they they just you know they they have this narrative. Khamenei is the best. Islamic Republic's the best. So whatever you tell us that fits that narrative, we believe it. Everything else is a lie, right? I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the general population. But how many people at the same time do you know? I certainly do. Um, extended family members or, or friends of family who come from Iran and say, 
don't believe everything you hear on Iran mm-hmm. International. Like it's always doom and gloom on Iran International. It's always the yeah. apocalypse. Apocalypse. It's really not that like that on the, you know, on the streets of Shiraz or, or Tehran or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it's it's a balancing act for us as well here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. But I think that's yeah. where the context comes it's, into play yeah. and, and the historical context and, and knowing who it is that you're talking to. So. For example, if you're talking to someone who spent their entire life in Iran under those circumstances, it's a little bit more normalized for them than for me, who hasn't been to the country in 20 some odd years, right? For me, hearing that, you know, someone's dog was picked up because they were taking their dog out for a walk is a lot more alarming than someone who has had to experience that 10, 20, 30 times over the course of their life. So I think that's also the context that I was referring to. In Western media, anybody want to um, suggest <laughs> something that they think? I, I, I asked around. I did a highly uns- unscientific survey of about uh, 10 people. So it wasn't, you know, it's, uh, but I asked for suggestions from mm-hmm. people. I thought there were smart people who follow these things of what, what they thought a good source was be, would be. And two or three people, people said DW, Deutsche Welle, which is German state TV funded by German taxpayers, which is available in 32 languages, including Persian. Yeah. So I went to, to DW and, and uh, it, I mean, it, it seems to be, uh, you're certainly better than CNN, mm-hmm. you know, um, but, uh, but, or maybe BBC Persian. Uh, I think this German state TV might be better, but, but anybody want to, did you have a Western source that you like? I just circulate between CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, um, and those are kind of the main ones, and especially because I have the alerts on my phone, it's just easy to do that. It's also convenience more than anything else, if I'm being totally honest. But if, there, like Raho said, if there's something that I care about, then that's where I do a deep dive, and then it's the talking to people, going exactly. on the different, you know. And that's uh, one thing I do because my following is very diverse, right? They don't follow me for political reasons, mm. so uh, they come from very, very different backgrounds. And what mm. I do once in a while is I put out a poll and I ask everybody to give their opinion. So I take in all of these views because even if I completely disagree with the person, I still read it. I still want to hear from them, right? And I make my judgment based on that. When it comes to issues outside of Iran, especially, mm-hmm. right? Because you know they're they're from so many different backgrounds. For instance, what's happening right now, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I've I've done a few polls on that because. I have people who are extremely pro-Israel and I have people who are extremely anti-Israel, right? So I want to hear from... Is that the way they frame it or pro-Palestinian? Oh, pro-Palestinian, mm-hmm. anti-Israel, want to destroy Israel. Mm-hmm. Israel shouldn't exist. That sort of uh, mentality. It qualifies right? as anti-Israel. Exactly, yeah. right. Yeah. And then on the other hand, very, very pro-Israel that anything that the government of Israel does, I completely agree with. We we need to crack down and continue this war and and you know so so d- very different polar opposites right? right and i want them to share their opinions i want them to share their views because i want to hear from them right mm-hmm. um, when it comes to iran though like i said i think the the best thing we can do is gather information from different sources and if we have the uh you know, if, if it's possible, talk to different people inside. I agree with you that there are independ- some independent people out there. It's like on the environment, I trust Kaveh Madani, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you know, no matter what his job is now. I mean, it's sort of, okay, I'll follow this guy and listen to and believe what he has to say about the environment more than I will the Iranian environment minister or something that's <laughs> written, written in CNN. Um, did you want to have a final yeah, point Yeah, I just on wanted to uh, point out on, on something interesting. That See I how I worked in Kaveh Madani, who's <laughs> about to come in studio? That's, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I asked around, just like you did, um, about, about this. And one thing that was very interesting to me is the way Iranians kind of view news and behave towards news and how Westerns, Western people um, view right. and behave towards the news. It's kind of like when you're talking to to um, to anyone who's grew, grew up here, they're like, I find I find this outlet and I trust it and I look for news there. But when it comes to Iranians, because they, I think they've been lied to so <laughs> much, they're like, yeah. I go around looking at what everybody is saying mm. and then I mm-hmm. conclude my own um, my own kind of analysis or like information or you know I decide on what I want to believe in but I, th- I just found that really really interesting the way we be- we behave differently the mistrusting yeah <laughs> yeah all right thank you
that was really good. I, I did have a third one that I think is too too hot to handle in, 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 in a couple of minutes here. Uh, are Iranians being unfairly expected to support one side or the other in the Israel-Hamas war? Park that in your brains because we'll come back to that uh, next week. Bahadur, it's such a pleasure to have you here as part of the roundtable. I hope you'll, hope you'll come back. It was, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much. It was great joining, guys. Thank you, Pega. Thank you. Resident Rahul. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys uh, on the roundtable next week. Uh, that is Pega Ganji, Raha, Ru, and Bahador, our last part of our roundtable this week. This is Rook episode 300, part two. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. You can find us on Spotify, on SoundCloud, on Apple, uh, Instagram, CastBox. If you want to see visuals with Rook, switch over to our YouTube channel. Uh, and descriptions and bulletins in English and in Persian can be found on Telegram. And if you'd like to support us, we would certainly appreciate that. You can do so by going to our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com, R-O-Q-E, obviously, media.com, and press the Support Us button on the main page there, right up at the top. And uh, it'll take you to our Patreon page where you can become a Rook member for a few bucks a month and support what we do and be privy to special privileges. <laughs> All right, let's get to our feature guest who has walked into the Rook studio. You know, one question that cannot be far from our minds on a day when more dire news has emerged about the nature of our climate and the world is just how bad is the environmental crisis. And in an effort to address the question in an accessible but informed way, we've got our returning champion, one of the leading voices in the world on environmental issues, Kaveh Madani is a globally acclaimed environmental scientist, activist, writer, and professor. Kavis served as deputy head of Iran's Department of Environment and as vice president of the UN Environment Assembly Bureau. He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the Environmental and Water Resources Institute of the American Society of Civil Engineers. He's received numerous awards for his impactful research, teaching, and humanitarian endeavors, reflecting his dedication to addressing environmental issues on a global scale. Kave is now the director of the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health, and a research professor at the City University of New York's Remote Sense. Earth Systems Institute. And right now, it's a great pleasure to have Kava Madeni joining me back here in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Thanks for having me back. Nice to have you back on the program. You know, I was thinking of you and the title that I've given this episode, Just How Bad is the Environmental Crisis? And I was thinking that being a well-known environmentalist and voice in that milieu these days must almost feel like being an unwitting prophet of doom you know like like you're always required to be the town barker telling us all the bad news constantly mm -hmm. and so i thought even before we begin the interview are you sick of doing these kinds of interviews where you have to explain how bad things are notwithstanding that that is your job of course <laughs> yeah and how bad things are and what must be done knowing that a lot of those things won't be done and can't be done right um it is sad i mean it, it is sad that you have to talk about negative things um you have to warn about the 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 dark future and and at the same time you want people to t you know act on it and take action and what if they lose their hope? What if my messages are so so sad and dark that people f feel that you know they're desperate? There is no no good sure. future. And okay, then I have today only and tonight only. I let me let me enjoy. Um, or even if if putting aside, there's no good future. What can I possibly do? I'm just one person, so then that's a prescription for quiescence, for just letting go, right? A absolutely, and I actually, we have this issue also. A lot of environmentalists, when do they do campaigns? You're familiar with uh, all those things about 
you know, action, action by government. So they're saying that, that the small things that, that citizens do um, have no impact. And you, it's only the, the government who, who can save the world. And you have to ask for the big actions. So, so if that is the case, then how would you convince um, those politicians to take actions? If, you, if the society doesn't care, if the society thinks that it, you have to wait for, for a, a, you know, an angel coming in right. to office and is willing to make changes and reforms, I think that all those small actions matter because a society that is sensitive to environmental matters can pave the way for the big changes, can make better choices choices when it comes to election, can make better choices choices when it comes to penalizing those right. who don't care right. about the environment. But it, it's 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 a hard dance. But it's a tough one, right? Because as you're saying that, I'm thinking, if you're here in Canada and you can barely make uh, you make the rent, or let alone if you're in Iran and you're you're your brother is potentially up for execution for being a protester. You're probably thinking, well, I don't give a fuck about the water situation or something. You know, I've got I've got more pressing issues, even though the environment is a ticking time bomb that we know we should care about. So so you're you're sort of fighting to keep an issue alive that uh, some folks will feel doesn't affect them in their daily lives. Absolutely. But that i mean living in different parts of the world and being from the global south operating in the global north now being in the un makes me very sensitive um to what message we should give to which nation at what time right so i was really really nervous when people during covid 19 were talking about the value of co the benefit of covid 19 for the environment thinking about you know what's going to happen to the economy and if the economy is going down right we're not going to care about the environment and this is what exactly you know exactly what happened right if i'm talk speaking to the iranians if i'm speaking to the africans people who are starving having a hard time buying meat it's very stupid of me if i send messages about avoiding meat red meat messages must be sent to the nations that are obese and are encouraging the rest of the world to mm -hmm. get into the steak business not to the people who are already vegetarian because they are they, they can't afford eating meat mm -hmm. the same is is true when it comes to you know sending messages or negotiations cop 28 is is is, is it's a, now it's yes. pretty much started yeah. <laughs> and and so I, which I is by the way just to explain it is the it's a climate conference it's a huge climate conference it right? is and and now it's going to be uh, the biggest con it's the biggest conference it's the biggest gathering of nations talking about climate change when i negotiated for iran i led iran's delegation to to cop 23 in 2017 in bonn when i negotiated on behalf of a nation what i try to bring up was the problems that the people of Iran cared about. Water, food, dust storms, sanctions, and, and, and other things. I didn't go there and, and sp you know speak about other things that matter to the other nations mm -hmm. because the ine inequality that you just mentioned about people within Canada or Iran or anything is also, it also exists between nations right so we have inequalities sure. within right. and between nations right. so if you are some have the more luxury to care about environmental issues than others. absolutely mm -hmm. i think the fact that we can care about tomorrow r reflects the reality that we are okay with today if i'm starving tonight if my life is in danger if they're executing my f brother um father tomorrow I'm not going to I'm not going to care about what's going to happen in 50 years. But isn't it also true I mean maybe this is just a stereotype but that the rich nations are the ones who are doing the more environmental damage? It, it's true. Right, it it right. is absolutely true and this is why the ones we, who do have the luxury to care are actually the ones who are creating the most problems. Absolutely. Right. And and it's this is this is you know the hypocrisy here, right? So so even let's let's talk about now Iran, Emirates that is going to host the the the, the next the, the cup negotiations. So if you look at their current emissions, Middle Eastern, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, their current emissions greenhouse gas emissions is is high that's a high level so they, they're among you know some of them are among the top 10 iran is number one in the middle east but the historical responsibility 
doesn't, you know, so they're not the one who created the problem. Indeed, they sold their oil as, a, as mm. a, at a very cheap price. Mm. And we had the accumulation of, of greenhouse gases produced by the industrial economies, industrial nations that are now concerned about the climate change correctly, but they are not willing to pay for a change in the course of development. So that is why we, we talk about fairness. And fairness is a very subjective issue, especially if you're dealing with an unprecedented problem. Right, but even when you talk about the discrepancy between nations, COP28 is being held in the UAE. I mean, I'm looking at an article from five days ago in the New York Times or a couple of weeks ago, Dubai's costly water world, where Dubai has spent billions of dollars to provide fresh water to its residents. And of course, it's tourist attractions. You know, it's like the new Las Vegas times a thousand. And experts are saying this is efforts are, are these th these things are straining the Persian Gulf's natural resources because Dubai is usurping all of that uh, to fund its or to to fuel its uh, its its business, which is tourism. So there's some double standards and, and irony in that being the place where the, the conference is being held as well, right? Absolutely, like it was when, you know, COP23, I was looking at Merkel, head of German delegation. We're in Bonn. She's not willing to comment on coal, coal power plants. So who am I in the world to comment on shutting down Iran's oil business? Same thing, same thing here. So we have UAE as the host of the host of the COP negotiations. Um, as a Middle Eastern, I'm happy that the, the game is now being being uh, led by some Middle Eastern nations that have similar concerns to, for example, Iranians or other countries of the global south about water, food, etc. But at the same time, UAE is not the best example when it comes to sustainable development and think about the future, right? right? right. So the, the business model, everything is, is very Americanized. At the same time, another thing you got to point, you know, point out and think about is they're rich enough to think about the future. They're rich enough to launch initiatives about, you know, controlling waste, reducing. Sure. You know, so so that is another message that we we got to digest here. Are we saying that no nation can care about the environment before they become rich, and no nation would damage its its, its environment too badly unless it becomes rich? Then how am I going to deal with this trade-off? What is the message? Right. I, and it's interesting because I. <laughs> I'm just listening to you thinking, I generally feel, I mean, it could be annoying if they're, if they're sitting in the middle of the road saying, just stop oil and I can't, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there waiting to move my car. But, but, but generally I think, and I, you know, there's people who have, who are annoyed by, or splashing the, the, the paint on the, the, the paintings, famous paintings and things like that. But generally I think of environmentalists, yourself included as, as heroic, you know, I think you're, you're doing work. I'm sure that most of it usually doesn't pay you incredibly well, and and most of it is you probably don't get much of a other than a pat on the back. Much thanks for what what you do, but it's heroic work, but not really in the eyes of the people who run the countries and the big corporations around the world. You you have actually said that um, um, that most governments, and not just Iran because we know Iran got a, got a problem with environmentalists, fear or don't like environmentalists. So there's a big con climate conference being held, but most governments don't actually like people like you. They consider you a pest, right? Yeah, absolutely, because you're questioning um, their decisions. And so it's, and I, I gotta, so the, the definition of environmentalist is, is very broad. I, I don't consider people who interfere you know, so they, they stop traffic and, and, and cause trouble for pe others as environmentalists. I don't think uh, the end justifies the means. It's, it's, it's absolutely incorrect to do those things. Those are, um, those are not ethical. And, and a, pe a person who's, who's doing damage to the fellow citizens today cannot worry about you people. You don't think splashing you. paint on a Rembrandt <laughs> painting uh, helps the environment? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, yeah, but 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 speaking of, of the environmentalists and why governments don't like them in general is because they are they are questioning and they're they're perturbing the space yes. there. They don't want things to go, th in, you know, in, in a certain ways. Now, if your economy in, like in, in other in some countries, like Iran, there is another issue. Environment is a good cause to unite people. It's very different from other matters, right? Our country just went through the whole, you know, uprising and all that. Right. We, we saw how there were like different groups, coalitions, disagreements, all of those. 
no one, no one thought that in all of those we shouldn't care about Lake Rumia or Zion the Root or Khuzestan because it's a unifying issue. It's a national issue. It has an unparalleled power to unite people. No matter if you support the Islamic regime or not, if you like, you know, this group or this group, of, you know, you're you like this group of opposition or that group of opposition. Mm -hmm. You what your ethnic ethnicity is, what what your religion is, it doesn't matter. You care about those components. So so that's another thing which makes the environmental oh, sort of, space sort of you care in terms of giving lip service. Absolutely. I mean, everyone cares about. You know, if I go out on the street right now in Toronto and say, you know, the, those plastic bottles you're using for your water, that's that's really wasteful. I, I don't think that anybody will disagree, but are they going to stop using the plastic bottles? That's the problem, right? So now we're getting into another issue. But one is like, would it lead to, to action or, or not? But we're talking about, for example, space where like there's no trust in, in government and, and coming out and, and fighting for hijab right. can be suppressed. Right. Fighting for for LGBTQ rights can can you know can, I got you. But I then environment, right. you they cannot tell you that you, you know you don't have the right to breathe. Right, right. right? You're not so, allowed to care about Lake Kumia. Yeah. Let me let me come back to you. Even on. though the, if, even they, though they, they don't <laughs> care about yeah. Let, let, let me come back and uh, because I, I just want to ask you about Iran, Iran obviously, um, and in terms of uh, as well, what progress, if any, or worsening has happened since the last time we spoke, which was before the uprising, but. Um, Sticking with this notion that, um, sadly, we're on a one-way conveyor belt towards doom. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate mm -hmm. to put it that way, but mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I, in my lifetime, I can't remember a time when, when there's been, you know, regular news coming out that the environment's getting better, that we're treating, you know, the world is, you know, doing better and better. So, so you've got this world of billions of supposedly intelligent, sentient human beings who are just creating more and more issues, more and more of a dump. It, it seems like uh, a tough gig to take to, to join the UN. <laughs> it's, not, it's not exactly the most obvious winning gig, you, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, wh why did you want to take that job? The day I was driving to work um, for the first time, rem I remember then the night I was leaving Heathrow to, to go back to Iran after so many years. And I was comparing which one is making me more excited. Definitely I was more excited going home to serve in Iran than when I was going um, to my office, my UN office. But I, I, I tried to convince myself that Iran is part of the map of the world as one of those nations that requires help. What gets me excited um, as a, a person working for the UN is actually bringing up these issues that we are speaking about today. Because I think UN, a lot of times, or the international organizations, especially because they're mainly funded by the Global North countries and um, the Global North scientists, and people have a strong voice in there, um, would develop or promote narratives that don't reflect the, the concerns and realities of the Global South. So then it's it's always about the blame game, that these nations must do this, must do that. They have to end poverty. They have to bring water, you know, give, give everyone access to water, environment, and so on. So I feel passionate about questioning that within mm. the UN system, at the UN system, using what, you know, we're... And uh, can you? Uh, can you make a difference in, in, inside that? that system i would imagine that there's patterns of behavior in the un that are pretty ingrained so so you, I, I i have no role in the security council and it has been set up in a way that it will remain inefficient for well that's forever. the other thing i mean most people don't even to be i mean no offense but yeah. most people don't yeah. like the, the un or yeah. they have yeah. they're quite cynical about the un yeah, right? yeah. you know so uh, you're facing that as well yeah i mean absolutely we, we are desperate i think at a time that that people are are, are struggling in gaza and, and access to water is, is a basic thing and we cannot provide that um, our, our colleagues are even getting denied like they can't enter the country their visas are being denied um, you can't do what is right the, there's like um, people are getting confused about which invasion is a good invasion and which invasion is a bad invasion so if you condemn 
Russia, shall you condemn Israel on the same basis or not? So, so there are these moments of truth that you, you face and, and you realize that the system that has been designed many, many years ago is not a good fit to decope with the existing problems that, you know, we, we, people are losing their faith. Multilateralism is, is being, being challenged big time and all of these things are, are happening. Yes, I understand that. But, okay, what, it, what is the choice? It's, it's like the environment. Shall I just, you know, hands up, this is going to happen. We're useless. Or just say there is still a brand, a trust in, in, a, in a brand. United Nations still making some people hopeful right. in some parts of the right. world. And now the United Nations University, which I work for, is a platform which, in, which in theory at least, gives me um, academic freedom and I'm allowed to say what science supports, even if other UN mm. agencies don't like that. And I, I, I try to just inject you know, some new insights, if possible, but I'm one voice in a, in a, in a, in a very large organization. My colleagues are trying, a lot of us are, have international origin and you know, we're, I'm boosting the confidence and yeah. saying the things that are different, but, but it's, it, it's tough. When, you're say, when you say something like multilateralism is challenged, even the word is challenging. Uh, when you say something like that, it, it does occur to me that, uh, you know, I, 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 we had an, an episode called uh, The World is on Fire about a, a month ago. A very uncreative title, but I mean, <laughs> everybody knows what we're talking about. It feels like, of course, metaphorically, the world is yep. on fire. Um, the, the Middle East war, the, the uh, Israel, Hamas, then Ukraine, uh, it, it, it does, um, it, it makes sense that somehow all of that going on in the world um, and the bifurcating, the, the, the balkanizing of the world, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the polarizing effect that has had on, on the world too um, and world opinion is going to have some effect on um, collective action for the environment. I'm not exactly sure what that is. You would know. What, what, what are you facing based on what is going on in the world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the COP negotiations this time would have would have been different if there was no um, conflict in the Middle East between Israel and Ga Hamas. Um, that's that's for sure. As it, the COP negotiations in the previous rounds would have been different if there was no invasion of Ukraine or no COVID nineteen. We know that when nations are struggling with other issues and they have other priorities, they won't care about the environment because by nature, environment is considered a tomorrow's problem, not a today problem. Today's problem, it, it becomes a today's problem when there is a big, big chaos, when there's mm. fire. You know, remember, the, the, we, we were here um, if you, if you, we, a few months ago. There were, we sm smelled smoke. Uh, uh, colleagues in, in, in New York saw the smoke going from our, our, yeah. our country to that. Yeah. How many people are didn't uh, stop at the border? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but who, who's talking about wildfire now? Just to tell me the media, the, the Canadian Nobody. media, Nobody. the American media. Yeah. It's it's gone. So so only a few days, and and then w w the, when the world has too many issues, then you jump from one crisis to another, and the attention span is limited. At the same time, the economic situation is getting worse and worse everywhere, including Canada. So it is it is very rational for people to to not care about tomorrow if they they have problems paying their mortgage and they're you know holding their houses and at, at this climate conference uh, would you go so far as to say that there are going to be delegations not speaking to each other or having issues with each other because of wars going on in the world I mean, does it work that way it it it, it work it but also maybe the de delegations speak to I mean, there are delegations that don't speak to each other um i was not allowed to some to speak to some nations when i was at the cup also but 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 when you were representing iran exactly yeah. but then the the issue is the excitement the excitement is less even the level of representation is is is, is lower less significant right so so this could have, these conferences are essentially boosters, right? They yeah. bring people in front of camera, shame them, encourage them, people make promises. So those are like celebration moments. People right. are, are high, they're on drug, and, and they make a decision that sometimes they don't even know how to implement it. But those are good moments for the world because big steps are being taken. Now, now the issue is is that when, when you have this climate around the world, then people don't, don't, don't engage. 
people now have a di very different understanding of what climate security is. I'm sorry, um, food security is. Mm. After the invasion of Ukraine, when the wheat prices got affected, wheat exports got affected. Energy security today means differently to the Europeans than two years ago. Um, because because when the moment Putin decided to to shut the the gas valve, mm. then the then the the story was different for for the Germans. So so everything is is changing. Even understanding and priorities are are, are changing. So of course the decisions are going to be different. This is a big cop. This is the biggest cop we've ever had. It's eight years. It's eight years after Paris. It's a time for countries to report what they have done and how, how what they have implemented. We have not made a significant progress toward what we wanted to right. um, do and, and implement. So, so wh what what do we have to say? Can we set another initiative before before delivering on the previous initiatives that we think? So people lose lose trust and and faith. I always say, you know, Iran didn't ratify the Paris Agreement. Iran's parliament didn't. Um, Donald Trump to, decided to exit. Um, the the agreement he he went out, yeah. The, but these two, based on different reasons, decided to you know not to respect the Paris Agreement. But at least they were honest. Both of them didn't commit and didn't deliver. But we had many nations that that committed and mm. didn't deliver. Which mm. one is worse, actually? If if you want to think about it, that I have a hard time answering that question. But if I know that I'm making right. promises right. and I'm not delivering on it, Back I think the lip I'm lip service thing. <laughs> then yeah, uh, yeah. and it, it it is seem it it does seem like a a cycle. I mean, to draw a, a macabre sort of analogy, you know the the school shootings in, in the U.S. Every time one happens, they go, oh my God, we have to do something about firearms in the U.S. And then three days later, everybody forgets about it seemingly and it goes on, you know. Uh, and in the same way, I mean, we've had epic, scary um, climate-related uh, madness in in you know or just over the last year whether it's um, tsunamis or f forest fires or or um, extreme heat or whatever and in those moments everybody goes oh we got to do something about the climate we got to do and then including joe biden or justin trudeau or whomever uh, but i'm guessing it's not going to be dominating the front pages in the next few days because there's other shit going on yeah and, and i i Remember, this was my my one of my first papers that I wrote after politics, one of the first journal papers in the academic world, and and I tried to say how people prioritize issues in public policy, how politicians do it. Um, it's all about relative urgency and relative importance. So, for an issue to get enough attention, it must be both very important and very urgent, and and relative to other matters. So, so when you have a crisis, and this was the title, you know. So essentially, we need <laughs> we need those crises that don't exterminate our system if you want to make price uh, uh, make progress. Unfortunately, that's a very sad thing to say, but this is how we we have made progress. The issue is that until you you really feel it's 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 urgent, you're not going to do anything because delaying is the dominant strategy. You just talk about it, lip service, even by politicians. Politicians also talk about the environmental matters. They don't take action. And on how it. urgent is it now? It's urgent, scientifically speaking, but it, from the from the society standpoint, it's not an urgent issue because my urgent thing is renewing my mortgage next year in in Canada. What is the most urgent issue globally, scientifically? So the most urgent oh, that I don't because I'm going to ask you I, about Iran, but yeah. I mean, if in general, you, you mean what, environment or yeah. gen general? Like, no, because no environment. I mean, it, your, your field. So, so the, in 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 the when it comes to the environment, it's really hard to prioritize things because every every problem we see is the byproduct of unsustainable development. If you do. If you take an action on climate, it has benefits to the other sector. If you have taken action on deforestation, it has benefits to the other things. But what I always say is, is don't climatize everything. Don't sell climate change as the only byproducts mm. of environmental um, in, unsustainable development. Uh, don't sell it as the main cause of everything else, because then there are many nations that don't engage. If you're talking to me in Iran, I care about pollution. I care about water. I care about the matters that I'm, uh, are visible, because that's what those are the ones right. I'm, I'm thinking right. are urgent. Right? right. If you, so, so many times you have the Middle East in answer to the studies of NASA or like you know American scientists. We say who say. In 50 years, the Middle East, some Middle Eastern places would would not would you know they would they would be hard to live in. 
they're like really like you know <laughs> future or are you talking about today like that's our condition today or they, they might even say like if if you do a study and say uh, you will have these problems in toronto in in 20 years they might say welcome to our world right because that's their condition now right. so so the issue is is that if you want to address environmental issues you got to be realistic you got to care about people that's why i say don't block traffic to get attention to to the environment you're causing trouble to people people have to be comfortable people today to be able to think about tomorrow in iran even here even here i keep talking about the the importance of bringing agriculture in in into the game in in Canada because with a shift in the government then no one would care about mm. the environment and all these incentives that we have created at a time that the country is is going down economically and it's true everywhere in the world so so pick a problem that is relevant to any society anything to to anything you do for that society for for the environment of that society would benefit every other sector so even if you ask me about iran i won't tell you water is the most important issue because water is one of the most important issues but you go to to gilan and and mazandaran and and the caspian sea coast there are issues with but, waste but let me ask you about iran and tie it into what you were, we were just talking about in terms of distraction and, and other things going on and other priorities. I haven't had a chance to have you on this program. I've seen you, but I haven't had a chance to do the interview since the uprising of last year in Iran. And it does occur to me, Kavajan, that, that, that one of the, the biggest issues that the Iranian diaspora was talking about before the killing of Masa Amini and the resulting uprising um, was the water crisis, right? I mean, there, there were notable demonstrations. There was one here, in, uh, big ones here in Toronto about who's it's on, water shortages, water crisis, water scarcity. Um, whilst not wanting to take anything away, of course, from the importance of the uprising for freedom and democracy over the last 14, 15 months, did it somehow usurp the attention that is necessary on the environmental situation in Iran. In other, in other words, do you have some concern about that, that that this uprising, which I'm sure you would support the cause of freedom and democracy, but um, kind of mo shifted the focus away from something like water in Khuzestan? It is very natural for a society that is struggling with, with getting its fundamental rights fulfilled to not, not pay much attention to the environment. Tell me if people in, in the Middle East on the Israeli side or or the Palestinian side today are caring about birds and endangered species in Gaza does anyone talk about what's happening to the environment in Gaza how can like you know our, our brothers and sisters going out on the street they're getting shot at are you gonna talk about um, Asiatic cheetahs you might do and people like it because then then they can complain there's yeah. another another you know just another good excuse to be mad at the system yes but it doesn't mean there would be an action the same was true here and when I when people were dying of, of COVID-19 I knew the environment would not get any attention I'm not concerned about the environment at the end of the day I care about humanity right that's what we are fighting for the quality of life for humanity and survival. The planet Earth will will last longer than us. It would be even happier without us. The environment would be happier without us. I'm concerned about humanity. And if I'm concerned about humanity, I can say I can't say tomorrow or the future generation is much more important than than, than No, but when we were talking about the uh, uh, of course all of what you say makes a lot of sense. But when we were talking about the water crisis in Iran a year and a half ago, 2 years ago, it was dire then. Yep. It was this. This is, this is bad. This mm -hmm. is not solvable in the next fifty years. Bad. You you came mm -hmm. on and talked about that. Nikolhen Kosar. Whatever. All kinds of people saying these things. I can't imagine it's gotten better. You know, no. over the course of the the last year and a half, where there's been an uprising in Iran, et cetera, and the regime has been focusing on suppressing people and executing kids and whatever. W what is the state of that water crisis now? So, so as I said, I, I always say there is no crisis anymore. It's bankruptcy. It's a failure. Right. So crisis is over. <laughs> crisis is when there is a Too chance kind to, of work. to <laughs> yeah. yeah so, right. so to to address the issue and bring the system back, a lot of these damages are irreversible. There's no way you can fix a lot of things that 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 have been done um, or, or have been damaged. So so a lot of those things, it's a state of failure. 
The issue is how deep are we going to go into it? Of course, the situation is worse. It's the situation because we haven't taken any action on it. The climate has been more friendly. Weather has been more friendly. We have more rain maybe than, than um, previous years or some of the managers are doing better in, in operating the reservoir, making sure there is enough water left for summer. But the situation is terrible. The problem or, or you know, the problem is that we, we have so many other problems that we can't, we don't have the bandwidth to deal with this problem anymore, to talk about this problem anymore. Has it been resolved? No. Have we lost attention to it? Yes, because we have so many other things to worry about. And people have lost hope. Hope is what you need if you want to do something for the environment. If a nation loses hope, environment is one of the very first victims. Have you ever heard the argument, it's, this is pretty cynical stuff, I've seen it in social media, where it's good that Lake Gormia is, has, has gotten into so much trouble or that, that this water bankruptcy is happening because ultimately it will lead to help lead to the fall of the regime. You're familiar, you're familiar with that argument. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there are there are things because people are even happy if, if people um, do protest, because, you know, farmers do protest because they have no water and, and so on. It's, it's, you know, so of course any, any, any um, change requires a sacrifice, but to say that it's it's good that this is happening, it's it's just you know very selfish, because yes, I can say it living here and not being any even even close to it, um, but but what happens to the people, the life, their like you know ecosystem and so on? I I think it's sad if we think that way, and yes, based on the same argument, then you can say you know even the environmentalists are bad because they're prolonging the life of the regime right. yeah. well, um, the a, doctors yeah. who are curing the the patients <laughs> right. the sure. teachers who are teaching yeah. the professors are, like all of those are you know if they stop working then there might be a, a failure of when a you say something like bankruptcy or you know i mean uh, there are things that people say about the environmental situation in iran like i i, I heard somebody say like it's impossible to fix at this point right i mean is that hyperbole? If if it's impossible to fix at this point, then then there's good reason for people to to be giving up and and being cynical, right? I mean, well, it, it, how are we supposed to make sense of that? I mean, analogies might might be helpful here. So, um, you know, so if if you in your forties and fifties decide that all of it, like in your I don't know, overweight by 30 kilograms and, and, and all of a sudden you're like maybe say 50 and you have a bad diet, you're alcoholic, you do drugs and, and your body has been damaged. Now you want to fix everything? It's impossible to fix everything. Yet you still can prolong your life by quitting a lot of things, consulting with the doctors, take some pills, changing your diet, quitting, quit using um, drugs and so on. So that's that's the situation. So we are degrading the environment. The environment has been degraded to the extent that many components cannot be fixed and reversed. But but it it's doesn't not mean, uninhabitable. Yeah, it's 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 not. It, we're here. <laughs> right. Well, we're not in Iran. I mean, I, I mean, I mean it, 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 yeah. It's it, it it'll somehow well that but that's yeah I mean again it's the chicken and the egg right yeah. because because if Al Gore was right with the inconvenient truth which he sort of was it's been a little long I mean I, you know I who was it Alexander Ocasio Cortez who said by the year or, or Greta Thunberg somebody yeah. said by the year two thousand and twenty three everything there there will be no Earth uh, anymore or something so so on the one hand those things are hyperbolic on the other hand they do inspire action right oh, if, you, no. if you if you if you think it's really dire like if you kind of go well you know hopefully that's the problem you we keep coming back to you you know yep. how are we all going to do something about this if we don't feel the urgency to do something about this i mean and the other thing is 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 you know, I you never hear me giving those statistics and telling you that by 2025 Iran would you know because because if you're if you understand science if you understand um, the progress that the humans are making like a lot of things that we're doing today innovation well, discoveries and so on so you know that there is also one side of you know there is there is hope there are there is this is chance for change of action change of course people thought we can't pass year 2000 we're hey we're we're ending 2023 right. it's very right. soon right. so 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 if you I, I think it's stupid actually 
to every year and I see some of my colleagues in, in, in science get get excited and, and they want to publish a high profile article and they say this is the last year we have a chance to address this issue and that issue no those are not true um, scientifically speaking they're not true either you know, so um, and but I'm not I don't care about their scientific credibility I care about people's li- loss of faith and trust mm. this happened to the Islamic Republic too so every year around summer they say we're going to run out of water we're going to run out of water it happens five years people you know that still water is coming from the tap it's the, boy the next year wolf. they don't stop yeah. listening yeah. so chupana yeah. durugu as we say in iran so we got to be careful <laughs> 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 that's another that's story about we can talk <laughs> <laughs> that's what i remember from being a kid <laughs> <laughs> you you grew up somewhere like that dude <laughs> was not <laughs> the major concern but um so so that that you know we got it we got to be very very careful about messaging we got to be careful about how we communicate to people hope and and so on and you you we were talking this about this before the interview you see me sharing a lot of exciting things on social media i want people to smile i want them to have good moments as I well i wouldn't say you shared nice things about animals yeah more recently it seems like i i was asking you before we did the interview if you're pre, pre- if you have a, a new preoccupation you were hanging out with my little dog and with <laughs> with animals because you've been posting a lot of animal stuff which i i know fits into the you know environmental file folder but but uh but but you and, and you had actually an interesting response to that which is you said that that stuff captures a lot of attention yeah and, and i i think because you know if if the only thing people see on my my page is like you know the doom day is coming you're doomed um your children would struggle stop producing babies like you know there is no life so what what yeah i get a lot of likes i think if if my profile is like that but then what is the consequence um what i find interesting is you know i just i i think raising awareness is is leading to that that sense of urgency right and to raise awareness you want people to be passionate about environment like the environment so people i i noticed that people like those moments yeah. those you know those cute animals yep. and we're the children of apartments and big cities we have never been exposed to the nature right yeah. so those moments are who helpful. knew that baby animals <laughs> on the internet could be popular yeah <laughs> and 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 then yeah. and then in the middle of those i can talk about serious stuff i'm you know otherwise it would be a page that is very i would say professional and bunch of science and i'm talking to people in my bubble and and we like each other and we're happy with each other but when you do that your reach gets stronger and of course sometimes it is about animals you're not a fan of circuses i'm not a fan of circuses yeah at least that employ animals yeah yeah you know i think any sort of abuse um, is is bad even when it comes to pets. You don't think the bear is choosing to be uh, in the <laughs> in the circus ring? Yeah, it's, it's not like consensual. Be, be, we, uh, <laughs> being paid for it. I mean, th- things are when it comes to the zoos. It, it's it's a little different because it, there are places in the world that that these are like you know essentially. Um, it's rescued animals, the yeah. animals that are being studied. I went and, to an elephant know, sanctuary in Thailand. Yeah. I think that so, the, the, the elephants were uh, happy to be there, it seemed, yeah. I, th- I think. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know their language, but <laughs> <laughs> please translate <laughs> next time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but but, but, but the, the, the issue, yes, I mean, I, I'm having problem with, with, with disturbing them. Uh, at the same time, I, I mean that's another thing to say. We, in the environment, we say we have equal rights to the, to to other animals, and we are not the you know superior to any other organism or 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 um, species. But in reality, w- we are fighting for ourselves. And I understand that you know all of us got vaccinated. I, I just had my 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 booster shot recently because I want to remain alive and mm. I just don't you're say You're not that. anti-vax. Yeah, I'm not anti-vax. I could be. That's the, that's the new trend. I thought, you, I thought you'd be on top of that. Yeah, yeah. no. For, I'm not anti-vax for the environment. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, 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 you know, because the best help to the environment is actually to maybe end humanity. That's mm. a strong statement or but but I, I can't if i don't want others to die i can still make a self-sacrifice for the environment but i'm not doing it and i'm not encouraging people to commit suicide mm. because i think what we care about is happy humans and i need to bring that smile on the on the face of people if they i want them to care about the All environment right. well on that note back to the doom 
uh, let me take you back to the doom because <laughs> I still have a couple of questions that are are less than happy. I just 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 on the Iran file again. I mean, first of all, you you posted a video on X, Twitter, um, showing a dust storm entering the northern borders of Golestan, a province from Turkmenistan, uh, impacting the cities and villages in the area. And in your caption, you mentioned that. Tur Turkmenistan has become a new serious source of cross-border dust in Iran. And I'm imagining that's part of the pollution, the air pollution crisis in Iranian cities. How bad is that? It is it is bad and it's it's growing further and further. We had Sistan and Baluchistan for many years. They had dust. Um, the, du the you know dust frequency and intensity got worse. Now more days of dust. Khuzestan didn't have dust in the past. Now we have dust in in southwest Iran and 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 western Iran in many many places if dust sometimes comes all the way to Tehran we have dust around Lake Rumia where you know because of the the wetland wetland you know so Lake Rumia drying up even other other places central Iran Gulf Huni any anywhere we have wetlands we we now have um, a dry wetland we have a new dust source now we have a transboundary dust coming from the north. Turkmenistan ha is having issues, and dust is a problem. That's that's another thing I keep talking about in 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 the UN because it's an orphan problem politically. It's not the problem of the global north nations. Mm. They're not even alert about it. They don't understand the consequences. In my opinion, dust is one of the worst environmental problems of the 21st century for which we are not prepared. We have no even no idea how to deal with it. I don't, I don't hear with. about the dust problem for Toronto. And 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 in this country we had in last time is there I think one? To, not Toronto, but you had ash recently. Uh, right, right. But, the but, fires. But, yeah. but but dust bowl in the United States uh -huh. and you know affecting. So so we have had that not too long ago. But dust particles travel. They travel from Africa to Florida. Dust particles like go all around the world in the dust belt. But that's not it. Because if, if some places are you know become un, un, so essentially if, if people start migrating from some places, then the, the consequences would be global. Can I ask a really dumb question? I'm sure this is a dumb question. No. I'm not taught offing. This is uh, uh, what what do we do environmentally that creates dust? So lots of things. It's a very good question. One is, for example, when I said wetlands drying up, so water or or you know, rutubat moisture is the glue of, of the soil, right? Mm. So when the glue is gone, when the soil is dry, then wind blow, you know, when the wind blows, gotcha. the, you know, so that's a simple explanation. So whatever affects this, now it's a drought, it's, it's less water become available, wetlands drying up, uh, farmers leaving their farms, right? So when there's a war in Syria, and, you know, we had this issue, and, and lots of other things. So then, then you have new sources of dust. Bad agriculture, unsustainable agriculture together with drought caused that in the US also, that's a famous one. So so now this problem is coming back mm. in those places and it's a serious problem. I thought you were gonna use an analogy again and look at me and go, let's say a 40 something 50 something <laughs> does who does a lot of drugs yeah. <laughs> like what are you looking at me for yeah, this is the first time you have me in the studio so <laughs> i'm excited that person could never get past all the drug use that uh, can i can i uh, do one one last question about uh, about iran and, and and as we wrap up here i'm so grateful to have you here actually and i'm going to ask you about how it's interesting that you are here rather than not in dubai but um there, there are currently still a number of environmentalists in jail in Iran. Most of them accused of being spies, I think. Some have died mysteriously in places like uh, Evin. Uh, we've obviously seen the implications of protesting against the regime with people being detained and tortured in the last year in Iran. What, what is the Iranian regime most scared of about environmentalists to, pr to imprison them in this kind of way? Uh, I we still have a hard time understanding what what happened in our case, but but I my my guess speculation is is the fact that that they think environment is not a priority, and and by speaking about the environment, you get attention to to a new new problem. You can create additional anger. Um, you can unite people. It's a very good cause. 
And then you might even affect the priorities of the government that wants to, I don't know, build desalination plants everywhere, petrochemical um, plants and, and, you know, more oil extraction, more mining and so on. And then with the environment language, you go there and stop them. Um, and you even encourage the, the general public to join you. So that's what I think. The rest about, you know, I don't know, monitoring Iran's missile activities and so on, that's just a to joke. Point, to, to point out the obvious, though, if that's the reason, I, I, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time I've said this, we've said this about the, the current administration in Iran, but I mean, it's it, insane. You know, we're, we're, we don't like somebody who's telling us, uh, telling the public about how bad the environment is. So let's detain them, imprison them, torture them, particularly kill them. I mean, you know, but, but that, uh, potentially I should say. But that, has, that, that also happens in many other parts of the world. Like, I mean, if you go to Brazil or like, you know, you to go environmentalists? To, to, to a lot of environmental activists actually get, get killed. And, you know, so then it's not always the state, but then there are like, you know, mining companies and um, so, so businesses that, that remove the environmentalists. So, so Iran is, is one of the peaceful places compared to a lot of other, mm. other countries. But, but when you have the same fear in, in some other countries, I, I had a student from Egypt, a PhD student, a former diplomat, two years is in, into his PhD program, the Egyptian intelligence realized that uh, I was Iranian. I, I didn't have any other passport. So they got very nervous about an Iranian having access, having inf access to the information about n the Nile. It was stupid because I was providing <laughs> information mm -hmm. through satellites. It wasn't me like taking their information. But that sort of fear, paranoia exists, and and they see this as an issue. They also, of course, the, when when um, they treat water as a national security issue, food as a national security issue. We know water can be used as a weapon during conflict, war. We see the conflict between Iran and Afghanistan. Um, so so those issues mm -hmm. are, are serious matters. And they're, I think they because they feel insecure, because many of them are incompetent, then they, they have a hard time understanding who's the friend, who's the enemy, who's the friend of the nation, who's the enemy. And I, I think the Iran's um, intelligence system is, is not about managing risk. It, the mission is to remove risk. So anyone who's potentially a risk to the system must be removed um, instead <laughs> of being managed. And that's what, what I, I, I do believe you acquit yourself very responsibly, but I think there's always a concern with you too, you know, that to, to watch your watch your back and be, be, you know, be careful with what you do out there. And, and you are now, you have this position with the UN, uh, this massive climate conference is, is beginning, is going on in, in Dubai and you're not there, is that can is that a security thing? I don't talk much about it publicly, but I mean, yes, I have concerns about traveling to some places in the world, but um, and I still carry an Iranian passport, <laughs> so I don't want to be given back as a gift right. because right. I don't know what's what's wrong. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, um, it's it's not something to talk about. Um, as we end off here. Um, what are you, what are you most hopeful for? <laughs> See, I'm trying to try. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> a year and a, a, an hour and a half later, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I try to turn it around for the audience. What What are you most hopeful for? Uh, not 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 most excited about because you know, but but hopeful for in the coming years. What do, what do you hope that? Can, can happen in terms of the, the kind of change that you want. I was going to ask you about, we're tight for time, I was going to ask you about environmental literacy and, and trying to, you know, um, um, see if in your role whether, whether increased environmental literacy can contribute to more sustainable practices on individual community levels, not just in places like Iran, right here in Canada or anywhere in the world. What are you most hopeful for? So, so my, my job is about minimizing damages. I, I think we're going down and I, I want to slow down that process. So that's, I'm, I'm very realistic about that. But, but in, in that process, I, I think um, there is a chance to, to change narratives, change the discourse and get attention, create the sense of urgency, provide practical solutions. So that's what, I'll, what makes me hopeful. Every day I wake up, I'm, I'm trying to do you know, something that is relevant to that. Um, environmental literacy. So that is being said. Actually, I w wish we could talk more more about it. But that's what what is make me hopeful. Iran has a lot of environmental problems. 
But if you compare it with a lot of countries in the region, you realize that Iran is not the worst, actually. It's encouraging to see Iranians care so much about the environment, while other nations, neighboring nations, don't care much about the environment. I think this is this is a reflection of a society that is making progress despite all its its problems. That that makes me hopeful. I'm glad you're not in Dubai, so that we could have you here. It's been a it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Always good to see you, and I really thank you for making the time and coming and sharing uh, your insights and educating us. Thank you, Gian. Thanks for your continued interest in a a dark topic. <laughs> <laughs> Hope to see you soon. Kavim Adani, the great Kavim Adani, uh, has been joining me here in the Rook Studio, the director of the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health. He's been joining me in the Rook Studio. And this is full time for Rook for today. Remember, for all things Rook related, go to our website, rookmedia.com. You've got our back episodes our funnies, our videos, everything's there, rookmedia.com, and also how you can support us and become a Patreon member. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Super Parisaw, Methodical Kave, Resident Raha, Smart Pega, Savvy Rohan, Bearded Omid, and Talented Anahita. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe. If you haven't done so already, you can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. You can find Rook Media on Instagram, at Rook Media, surprisingly enough. In the meantime, as ever, Mizun Bashir.